Uh, hi, I'm uh, Robert van Soest. I'm a uh, uh, last year resident in urology in uh, Rotterdam, uh, the Netherlands. Yes, that's a very uh, interesting question because as we all know, uh, tumor heterogeneity increases uh, over time with more lines of therapy. Um, and actually certain of these treatments can induce specific uh, genetic alterations that confer resistance to therapy. Um, so yes, to really have a personalized medicine approach, we need sequential genetic material from the patients. Uh, so we need sequential biopsies or in the ideal world, uh, patient-friendly liquid biopsies to monitor this tumor and we should have this ideally at progression and before we start a new therapy because we know that certain of these genetic alterations for example to uh, in the energy receptor can confer resistance to AR target drugs so, such as AR mutations or AR gain or AR splice variants um, and to really tailor our therapy we need to know these alterations uh, up front and um, this can be done by, uh, by liquid biopsies. Uh, however, at this time, uh, it is not routine clinical practice, yet it is still uh, in development, uh, and there need to be a consensus about assays and about the uh, value of the assays before this can be implemented in, uh, in routine clinical practice. Yeah, that's a, uh, an important question. I think this depends on the therapy. So if you are talking, for example, about the AR target drugs, in fact, one single genetic alteration in the androgen receptor can confer resistance to AR target drugs. So for these kind of therapeutics, um, you would only need a single biomarker, such as the ARV7, to predict therapy outcome. However, when you're talking, for example, about chemotherapy, there is not one gene that predicts uh, resistance or therapy outcome for chemotherapy. Uh, in this case, you would need, I think, a gene panel. Uh, but at this time, we don't have a specific gene panel predicting response or resistance to uh, chemotherapy. But for example, when you're talking about the PARP inhibitors or about immunotherapy, um, which is still subject of investigation, of course, but when you look at these studies, of course, you have a uh, specific genes that can predict the therapy outcome, for example, alterations in homologous repair deficiency genes, um, or for uh, the immunotherapy treated patients, patients who are MSI high. Uh, so these specific panels can be used for specific treatments uh, to uh, to predict the therapy outcome in the future um, and to uh, to tailor uh, our therapy. Yes, uh, I think it is very important that it has been established now that there is certainly cross resistance between abiraterone and enzalutamide. It has been proven now in phase three trials. So this is level one evidence. And now we know that we should not deliver this treatments in sequence. But indeed, importantly, it's also uh, good to consider that based on the preclinical models, but also based on retrospective clinical data that the efficacy of those taxol decreases partially when you give it after abiraterone and enzalutamide. So when you look at the PSA response rate, you see 50 or 60% PSA response for those taxol in first line. But when you give it after abiraterone and enzalutamide, it decreases, it becomes like 30% in these studies. And when we look at our preclinical models, we see that those taxol also has an effect on the energy receptor by inhibiting the AR nuclear translocation and that those taxol cannot have this effect anymore in cells or patients pre-treated with ABI or ENSA. So this might explain this partial cross resistance. However, we didn't see that for Kabazi taxol because we showed in the models that it has a very pronounced anti-tumor activity and by cytotoxic effects. And what you see 
is really uh, concordant with the clinical observations from the CAR trial and from the other retrospective data that cabazitexel remains its activity uh, in third line. So what is the ideal treatment sequence? This is a very hard question to answer. I think the only thing we know from randomized data is that we should not give ARTA after ARTA. Um, but when we consider the whole sequence, there are only some retrospective studies, for example, the FLAG database from Stefan Udar, where he showed that actually patients who get first-line chemo and then second-line chemo and then AR-targeted drug yield the longest survival benefit followed by chemo, then AR-targeted drug, and then chemotherapy. So certainly, I think cross-resistance plays a role uh, in the treatment sequence. And based on this hypothesis, um, the, the, the preferred treatment sequence might, in fact, be to, to give chemotherapy first and not miss your window uh, of opportunity to deliver this. Um, but in this, in the, in the current treatment uh, era, of course, chemotherapy in a lot of cases has been moved forward already uh, based on the charter data.